on the News Channel 5 Network. This is Open Line. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Open Line. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Carrie Sharp. The topic tonight, criminal justice reform. It is a hot topic all across the nation. We're going to talk about where Tennessee falls in that reform. I have two wonderful ladies here who are really boots on the ground here in Tennessee, know what's going on to answer your questions. This is Open Line. It is your chance to call in and ask those <coughs> questions and sound off. Give us your opinions as well. We're going to put that number up on the screen so you can see that. Go ahead and give us a call as I introduce these wonderful ladies. We have Tori Venable with a Americans for Prosperity, the state director. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And also Hetty Weinberg with the ACLU, the Tennessee executive director. Thank you for being here. Good to be here. Tori, let's start with you. I would love for you to tell us about your organization and what you all are doing when it comes to criminal justice reform here in Tennessee. Okay. So we are a grassroots organization. We've got roughly 46,000 volunteers across wow. the state. We've always engaged in the areas of low tax, less government, uh, but we have come to realize <laughs> that we needed to expand our scope because you cannot have economic freedom unless you have freedom in the first place. And so this is why we began engaging on criminal justice related items. We had some major victories at the federal level working mm -hmm. on the First Step Act. And we've come to realize that, you know, especially <coughs> working as part of a bipartisan coalition, we can just accomplish so much more that will do good for so many people. Sure. Hetty, a lot of folks have heard about the ACLU, but maybe just not really familiar with what you guys are doing day in, day out. Tell me about that with criminal justice reform. Sure, and we use a model where we engage folks around awareness, advocacy, litigation we're best known for mm -hmm. in our legislative work, and that's where Tori and I have found common ground. Our commitment to criminal justice reform comes out of, out of our belief that individuals obviously have the right to due process, equal protection under the law, and that our prison system is just far too crowded with folks who really shouldn't be there. Some have mental health issues, some have substance abuse issues. We have uh, such uh, rigorous laws that were locking people up, recognizing that when they get out, mm -hmm. they return. The yeah. recidivism rate is so high. So our commitment is, as Tories, if I can say, to public safety, to ensuring that due process equal protection for all people, regardless of their economic uh, status, is assured. And one way we're doing that is looking at um, sentencing reform, parole and probation reform, and especially reducing recidivism mm -hmm. and easing re-entry into the community. Very just crucial topics as folks are getting out, how they really make their way in society as mm -hmm. a free person, as a productive member. Often I think when people hear the topic criminal justice reform, they think it is either public safety or rehabilitation, that it can't be both. You can't have a safe public and a crime rate that is low and people who are also not being held in prison for their entire life. Do you all find that? Well, initially, some folks believe mm -hmm. that, right? Uh, but as we've engaged more and more on this issue, that's exactly what it is. You can have safe streets and you can provide really second chances for individuals. And so getting people to come together, we've seen what Texas has done and they put the same focus so that they were <coughs> only locking up violent criminals and, and not using jail space for people that had nonviolent not minor offenses and their crime rates have also dropped to the lowest rate since the 60s. And Texas is very much like Tennessee as far as uh, the political spectrum goes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very conservative state. You wrote an article, uh, an opinion piece in the Tennessean recently where you pointed out about 30 other states have really attacked and are further ahead than Tennessee in their criminal justice reform measures. Mm -hmm. And that they have seen crime rates lower. What are some of the steps along the way that you think have been critical? Well, one of the biggest things is putting the rehabilitation as part of it. So it's not just punishment, and it's not even prioritizing rehabilitation over punishment. It's pushing the two things together. So as Hetty had mentioned, so that we're not just locking up individuals that have an addiction or a mental health issue. We're actually trying to treat the root of the problem and treat the provide some solutions so that they're not just in that revolving door. And you mentioned Texas has seen its crime rate lower. What other positive steps have you seen in some of these other states? Uh, Georgia, I believe, also recently passed it as well pa a few years back, and they've already started to see some results. Yeah, what's exciting, I think, is that this bipartisan coalition mm -hmm. of organizations, again, committed to 
public safety, reducing incarceration, second chances, and thinking about, frankly, how to save taxpayer dollars and to use the money, perhaps, for substance abuse, mental health services, certainly focusing on the juveniles, the school-to-prison pipeline concept mm -hmm. for young people, you know, from the age of five or six, especially in the urban centers, right. find themselves, you know, the back of the classroom and the principal's office, suspended, expelled, no mandatory alternative schools, and if they are in alternative schools, they're not high quality. So, and that just means that there is a domino effect. Those mm -hmm. are the kids who end up not only in juvenile detention, but down the road in prison. So better to put some resources on the front end. One of the areas we've talked about um, is bail reform, recognizing that in this state, there are about 30,000 people in jail, and half of those people are pretrial detainees. That means that they're waiting trial. Mm -hmm. They don't have the, if they are eligible for, for bail, and bail is set, often quite high, and they don't have right. the resources. Mm -hmm. So talking about how to do bail reform and what that looks like. So how do you do that? What would you propose be a better way? Well, we can look at places like Kentucky and D.C. who have, New Jersey, have who have looked at how to, um, and we have a great state law, let me step back, we have a great state law that actually says if someone is eligible for, for release, then they should, the least, um, least restrictive means should be used to allow them to leave jail in preparation for, um, you know, their release mm -hmm. prior to trial. And we have seen that um, our law then would say release on recognizance, ROR. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually in the law, but we're not seeing the law effectively enforced. And so there's a lot of conversation about why is that. There's a strong bail bond in the industry. They have, you know, a commitment to want to see their profits sure. maintained. And, and from our perspective, the collateral consequences yeah. of keeping someone pretrial uh, detained is very, very dangerous, not only for the community at large, but for the individual who loses ties with family, might lose their job, mm -hmm. um, drop out of school. Yeah, it really starts the cycle of poverty. So if someone gets locked up and they can't afford their bill, they lose their job, then they could lose their car, their house, be separated from their mm -hmm. families. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of thing that really drives that uh, the recidivism rate. Exactly. So we, we've got to you know put, put a stop on that. And there's a lot of different ways that have been proposed to do it. So one of the things that's in the legislature this year is something called citation in lieu of arrest. And so we already have that policy, and this is for nonviolent misdemeanor type charges. Um, and, and those would be the folks that instead of booking them and taking them to jail, they would get a citation that would have to show up on their own to get booked. And so that, that's something that would at least keep people still employed, mm -hmm. that they would be able to go and go around their work schedule. What is Tennessee doing well right now? I think there's a wonderful commitment on the part of law enforcement and sheriffs across the state that recognize that having folks in jail with mental health issues and substance abuse issues um, is not good for anyone. Mm -hmm. And so there's some very innovative programs where um, sheriffs are, and probation officers too, are working to ensure that um, individuals are not locked up but, pro but instead provided services. Workforce development, ensuring when people are in jail prior to them getting out that mm -hmm. there's some good training so that individuals, as Tori said, come out with the ability to make a living, sure. to get the housing, to reconnect and not recidivize, which is what the real problem is. You know, it's a revolving door and that's what we hope to Oftentimes, end. sadly, people serve their time and then it's, here's your belongings, bye, yeah. good luck. At midnight, in an empty street right. with no money to get to perhaps mm -hmm. some family member or friend who's still willing to communicate with them. And if you think about, well, how would I handle that? It's like, oh my goodness, and I've, I've got resources right now and I have an education, but still, how would I handle that? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you put your place yourself in those people's shoes. We have a lot to talk about. We're gonna take a quick break. We would love to hear your thoughts on the topic of criminal justice reform. Join our conversation tonight. The number's on the screen. We can get those calls lined up during the commercial 615-737-PLUS. Stay with us.